Stories of the Science Podcast with your girl and with an everyone and welcome to another episode of the Roots of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. My guest today is Patrick Musau. He identifies as Kenyan but also grew up in Ethiopia, Rwanda and Tanzania. Currently, he is a PhD student at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, United States. In this episode, we learn how he always had a great fascination for technology, even from a young age. Now, in his PhD, Patrick is working on problems related to ensuring that autonomous systems operate safely and function as intended. He applies these techniques to autonomous remote-controlled cars and drone applications. Now, as we all know, autonomous systems are an exciting area and have the potential to revolutionize industries. We discussed with Patrick, how close are we um, from this actually happening? Lastly, we delve into some personal experience on how he dealt with feelings of self-doubt during his journey and so much more. Remember, if you've always wanted to start a podcast, using Buzzsprout as your host will be the easiest solution you'll make. Now, let's get into this podcast. Hi, Patrick, and welcome to the show. Hey, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to have you to just teach us about everything that you're doing and just get to know you a little bit better. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks. All right, so let's get into it. So tell us um, a bit about yourself, Patrick. Where are you from? Where are you currently based? And what are you currently doing? Yeah, um, my name is Patrick Musau. I'm a Kenyan PhD student. Um, but my experience has profoundly been shaped by growing up all over East Africa, um, in Rwanda, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. I was actually born in Addis Ababa, and Ethiopia holds a very special place in my heart. Um, my mom worked for the African Union, and then she subsequently worked for the United Nations uh, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So I moved uh, a lot growing up. And I just finished up my third year as an electrical engineering PhD student. It's based in Nashville, Tennessee. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So, um, you mentioned that you, you, you growing up, you moved, you know, to several places in East Africa. Um, with that being said, did you have troubles like identifying yourself, you know, especially that, um, question, like where are you from? How did you deal with that? Yeah, definitely. I think for me, the whole idea of identity is a little fuzzy. Um, because I think my identity is a sum of all these things, all the places that I've lived. Um, and that's actually been a blessing. And sometimes it's also a curse because sometimes you feel out of place anywhere. Um, but I've learned really to grow comfortable in the place that I call home at the time um, and just plug into those communities. Um, yeah. All right. All right. No, that's good. Being adaptable is a very good trait. And that's something, like you said, um, growing up, Become, becomes handy but apart from you know your your travels of east africa another interesting fact about you is that you are a rugby player and you're actually one of the captains for the nashville rugby football club tell us more about that please yeah definitely so i've been playing rugby since i was about nine years old um I played all throughout high school and I fell in love with the game, much to my mother's chagrin at first. Um, But she soon turned into one of my loudest fans, which was really energizing. Um, Beyond just the physical challenge and uh, how addicting the game is, I've always cherished the community. Um, There's just something uncanny about tackling people for an hour and then sharing a drink with those same people after the game. And I've just loved that community that I found here in Nashville. Um, It's a really good group. really good group of guys and i've had the opportunity to travel all throughout the southeast u.s um, and it's taken me to places like new orleans charlotte north carolina atlanta memphis Ch- chattanooga and many other cities so it's been a fabulous time oh i'm great that you've you've enjoyed it you know it's quite interesting to me that you mentioned that there is 
a rugby community because when I think of rugby, the main, um, in terms of the countries, I think of South Africa, your New Zealand, your England, um, America is, well, from my, from my level of knowledge, you know, I stand to be corrected, um, is not, you know, that big in terms of the rugby. It's more football. So uh, the, the actual football, the American football. So um, can you just tell us a bit more about that? Like, I didn't even know. So this is so interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, the U.S. actually has the most registered rugby players of any country, I believe. Um, and they actually have a really wow. old, yeah, really old and very um, strong rugby community. Um, there's actually so many places that play rugby. I played all throughout college. Um and that was fun. In the Northeast and the West Coast, there's some really good clubs out here. Over the last two years, there's uh, been the growth of the Major League Rugby, which is the professional side of the U.S., and they've actually recruited some really high-profile players from New Zealand, South Africa, and all other places. But even beyond that, just the grassroots uh, American rugby has really grown over the last couple of years. And we've seen that even on the international scene where the U.S. has actually risen up the rankings quite significantly and even last year the really impressive record of the usa rugby sevens so yeah the rugby community in uh the united states is definitely growing and it's an exciting place to to be and to watch um and we'll see how far they progress in the coming years wow that's very interesting i learned something new so to learn even more um can you just give us uh because you you are a rugby player but you know, the reason why you're here is because you of your um your 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 field and being in STEM. So please just paint us a picture in terms of how you got into this field. What were some of the influences? Did, was getting into this field like a conscious decision or was it something that just happened to you? Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest, it's a, a mix of both. Um, I've always been fascinated with technology. And growing up, my mom would always say that I would break all my toys just to see what was inside. Not that I wanted to understand, but I just wanted to see. Um, and I think that, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, I think that curiosity built over time. Um, funny enough, I actually wanted to pursue political science when I first came to university in the States. Um, partly oh. because... I, yeah, <laughs> partly because I participated in the East African Model United Nations program, and I absolutely loved it. Mm. I loved debating mm. resolutions and feeling like I represented the policies of an entire country. So following in my sister's footsteps, I pursued higher education. And when I got to college, I took one physics class. Then I took another. Yeah. And then one professor who would go on to be one of my greatest uh, mentors asked me if I wanted to major in physics. And I said, why not? And that was that. Mm. Um, and that professor's wow. name is Dr. Mm -hmm. um, so that professor's name is Dr. William Baker, and he's also one of the major reasons I'm pursuing electrical engineering. Um, mm. He always was willing to sit down with me and just talk. And uh, beyond being an absolutely phenomenal scientist himself, he was also incredibly kind. Um, and since then, I've been working in STEM. Um, yeah. So that's kind of how I, I got into STEM, and ever since then, I haven't looked back. I've enjoyed it, and the people in STEM who have uh, been massive in shaping my experience. Yeah, it's quite interesting that, you know, you went from what you thought initially would be, you know, political sciences. Can I ask, would this be because of also your influences with your mom working in the AU and the UN? Was that also another reason why you leaned to maybe going into that apart from your other extramural activities? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, if I'm really being honest, uh, I was also following in my sister's footsteps. So she got her master's um, from City University of London in international politics and human rights. And yeah. seeing that growing up, I was also like, huh, maybe I should do this too. And I really enjoyed the kinds of books she was reading and the ideas she was discussing. So that was also another reason I wanted to go in that direction. But it's interesting how my experience shaped when I went to college. Um, I actually realized that I really enjoyed uh, STEM. And I still read a lot of that material and figure out how mm -hmm. I can bring that even into STEM. So yeah no that's 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 very interesting and i like how you mentioned that there was that one professor who kind of helped you guide guide you into 
into the field that you're in because i mean we, we might have lost you and you might have been in, you know <laughs> in the other field by now and we wouldn't even be having this conversation so that's fantastic so you said okay undergrad you did physics were you mm-hmm. doing um electrical engineering from undergrad or did you branch into that postgrad like just um clarify that for me yeah, definitely. So yeah, my undergrad was in physics, um, but I did some computer science classes while I was in undergrad as well, and I really liked those classes. So when it came time to graduate, um, there are two kind of paths that I, at least my friends took. Some went into higher education to pursue um, advanced physics degrees, and others of us wanted to go into engineering. And I'd always known kind of from the beginning that I wanted to do engineering. So I sat down with this with Dr. William Baker, who's one of my mentors, and I asked him, and I was like, I kind of want to go into engineering. What do you think the next logical step is? And he was like, well, if you if you really enjoyed physics, maybe you should look into electrical engineering. Um, and he kind of looked, mm-hmm. helped me look through some programs, um, and Vanderbilt was actually one of the ones that I looked at. Um, ended up applying to some electrical engineering programs and some other ones and accepted the electrical engineering one. So kind of shifted fields when I got to grad school, um, but I've loved it. It's been a challenge at first because it was a kind of uh, a shift completely of what we yeah. were doing. And I had to do some catch up work, but yeah, I really, I'm really happy with the choice I made. Well, I'm glad. And isn't it a little bit ironic because earlier on you were saying that when you were growing up, you used to like break things and to open them up and then, you know, years later here you are and sort of like engineering which kind of works with something similar along those lines if 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 i can say like that yeah definitely at least that's the story i'm telling myself (laughs) (laughs) you knew from an young age you knew (laughs) i guess yeah i I guess so (laughs) if i really had to ask my mom i probably just broke toys to break toys but uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, we'll we'll take this one so yeah. like you said you're currently a third year electrical engineering phd student at mm-hmm. vanderbilt university and your research work focuses primarily in the use of verification techniques and software tools to foster the creation of intelligent autonomous cyber physical systems with learning enabled components wow that's a mouthful um so i just want you to explain further what um, that is about and how you got into it yeah definitely um so that's uh really my advisor's research focus um so he deals with verification of cyber physical systems and what a cyber physical system is is it's a a system where there's some interaction between software and physical the physical world. So you can think about it kind of like a self-driving car. So a self-driving car right. is interacting with the physical world, but it's controlled by software. So there's an inherent uh, interaction there. And now when we talk about um, learning enabled components, what I mean with that is the things that realize these technologies um, are often powered by machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these things are usually constructed for massive amounts of data. So that's why we call them learning enabled components because we're learning certain patterns or functions from data sets. So within this space, uh, our work focuses on creating tools and techniques that ensure autonomous systems such as drones and self-driving cars operate safely and they function as intended. Um, And we specifically focus on the machine learning algorithms. Um, Over the last years, all over the world, we've seen how AI has revolutionized industries. And specifically, one class of models within AI is neural networks. And they've enabled technologies that we use every day, such as Siri or the facial recognition technology that unlocks our phones. So the challenge with them is that they're inherently black box. Um, and without guarantees, we can't conscionably allow them to be pl- deployed in safety critical s- settings where we have to risk human lives. Um, and Wait, one thing, you said, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, you said they are invariably black boxed. What does that mean? So black box means that we we can see the predictions they make, but the underlying operation mm-hmm. is not clear. So. Basically, they're really powerful models of map of capturing 
capturing mappings between input data and output data, but the specific underlying operation of the neural networks is often indiscernible to the uh, to people analyzing them. So we know how they we know that they can make very good predictions, but the actual mechanics of how they make specific predictions is often um, indiscernible. So that's what I mean by black box. Mm, okay, I'm I'm with you now. Yes. So. Um, over these couple, a couple of years, we've also seen that rigorous testing won't cut it either. So one of the most fascinating thing, fields within machine learning is adversarial machine learning. And this field uh, deals with AI in that you can fool these highly competent models to make uh, misclassifications or make errors just by slightly changing the inputs you provide to them. So unfortunately, by rigorously testing those, we can't rigorously demonstrate that they won't make mistakes. So this is where formal verification comes in. Um, and formal verification, instead of focusing on testing, is focused in proving yeah. or disproving the correctness of these algorithms. And we've been working on techniques to do that specifically for neural networks. Um, so we apply these, these techniques in two contexts. Specifically for me, I'm working on uh, a one-tenth autonomous remote-controlled car called the F-one-tenth platform um, that was developed by the University of Pennsylvania and is now used at many institutions across the world. So every year, oh. they host racing competitions where the task is to see who can program these remote-controlled cars to navigate the racetrack as fast as possible. Um, we've participated in two competitions so far, and we'll be participating in a virtual rendition of this competition in July. So this is one of the platforms where we're trying to apply our formal verification techniques to. Can we rigorously prove that the car won't crash into walls, um, for example, or that it won't make yeah. misdetections when um, the neural networks are being used? Um, so it's particularly in the computer vision context where the neural networks are doing classifications for driving decisions or recognizing objects such as an obstacle or the car in front of us. Um, and additionally, we're actually doing this in a second context too, and that's the drone applications. So oh, we've, okay. we're also, we've been participating in another competition known as the Cyber Physical System Virtual Organization, where the program is to um, program a drone with a downward facing camera and other sensors to search for an ideal experiment site for the deployment of a soil probe. That's the task for this year's competition. And then bring the probe back to the base after a pre-specified um, dwell time. So that competition is designed for undergraduates and we've enjoyed working with some undergraduate students at Vanderbilt who I still collaborate to this day. Shout out to DeAndre Rutayasire. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> So. Wow. Mm -hmm. What you're doing sounds so amazing and sounds, you know, so like in the future. But like you said, the future is now because this is currently what's happening um, in terms of, you know, self-driving cars and the um, the work that you're doing just sounds riveting. I'm literally sitting here like, whoa. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure you... <laughs> So like uh, in terms of everything that you do, what's the best part? Is it the like the getting to test um, the cars or is it in the process of like test? Uh, well, um, when I say test, I mean like when you do the competitions or is it when you are in, when you are, uh, are you in the lab? Do, mm -hmm. do, you, do you, yeah, when you're in the lab and you are putting all of these components together, what's the best part of the research that you're doing? So, yeah, definitely. Um, so a couple of years ago, when we first saw this competition being advertised, um, I saw it online and I actually had no experience with self-driving cars or um, autonomous agents uh, in any context. Mm. But I knew that it was something that looked really cool that I wanted to get into. So I, with a couple of lab mates, one whose name is Diego Manzanas, we decided that we were going to do this competition. And I remember we took the classes on, online um, and the materials that the University of Pennsylvania had put online. Um, and we built our car and we started programming it. And then for a couple of weeks, nothing was working. Um, so then a couple <laughs> weeks later, we actually got it to drive. And I'm telling you, this car was driving painfully slow but it actually navigated the racetrack. And on that day, I don't think I, the, we were smiling so hard on that day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was honestly like I'd been transported back to being a kid. And you know, when yeah, you first drove the remote, 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, your first time when you, uh, as a kid, you hold the remote of a remote controlled car and you're just absolutely enthused about making something else drive. That was the feeling that we had. Um, so for me, working with these cars has been one of the best things for me. Um, and, and yeah, just to see that, to go from not knowing anything before and just putting in the work and doing my best to learn that you could actually program these cars um, to drive themselves and that I could actually be a physical participant in the self-driving revolution that we're having um, in this decade was absolutely enthralling. But even just to work on those problems has been the best part. Um, making the mistakes, seeing a crash, all of it is all of it is fun. Mm. You know, when you're talking about the remote, um, I also had the same picture. Like I can just imagine um, a kid who might be listening to this and it's like, oh my word, I can actually do this. And like when I'm older, I can build cars and then get to self-drive them. That is so awesome. I love, I love that whole concept. It's it's literally a childhood dream for so many people to get to um I don't want to say play, but you know, they get to build it like how you built it and, and then just have that fulfillment of actually testing it, which is pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah, it is, definitely. There's a lot of room within this research for people to join. So definitely, I want those kids to dream. I want those kids to come and realize that they can participate in this revolution themselves. Um, Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So um, back to uh, the whole um, autonomous systems. Um, The autonomous systems are actually an exciting area and they have a potential, like you mentioned, to to revolutionize many industries which is great however there's this issue that you know the whole rise of the machines will leave many people jobless you know so what is your take on that yeah i think that's a a really good question to ask and i think one question that we don't ask enough in tech is how are the products i'm thinking about creating or helping create leaving out marginalized communities yeah. And definitely the people who will be displaced um, by the rise of machines is something that econ- economists and uh, people in, within the AI community need to address. I haven't con- mm. personally considered that the economic impact of the autonomous systems myself, but I know that there are definitely people who are doing some great research and looking into that. So from my perspective, I can think I can talk about the rise of the machines. Um, I think we're still uh, very far away from the supposed rise to machines. Um, to be honest, <laughs> while we've come a long way in designing effective and impressive AI, they're still very incapable of replacing humans in contexts that are unstructured. Um, there's a really good book by Janelle Shane called Hey, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. And then it kind of describes this AI revolution we're in and shows how far we really have to go in AI. Um, it's oh, okay. Yeah, and she considers an absolutely in an absolutely absorbing read how smart is AI really and how does it solve problems, understand humans, even drive self-driving cars. And she kind of shows us that while a lot of people tend to think of AI as a sci- kind of science fiction level AI like Skynet and so forth, what we have today mm-hmm. is actually a lot less complicated than that. So the rise of machines hasn't happened and I don't think it'll happen in the next five years. I stand to be corrected and I'd love to see it, but... Um, so even just, if we look at that, the title of the book, the title of that book was Mm. produced by a text generating neural network that was being designed to generate pickup lines. And the best thing it came up with was, (laughs) Hey, you look like a thing and I love you. So if that, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) it's a a really good book. Um, I definitely encourage people to read it. It's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So that's the best line it came up with. Like, hey, you look like a thing. <laughs> yeah, hey, you look like a thing and I love you. I don't know. I don't know if that would work on anybody, but I thought it worked for me. It was it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, so anybody listening and they want to use a pickup line, here is one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here definitely. Is one. <laughs> <Here> is <one>. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, I don't know if you, you you finished saying your point. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question before cutting you. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So you said, you okay, like we said, we, we're laughing about this book. Um, but, you know, in terms of how the media or how we it's been conceptualized to, you know, the normal everyday people who are not 
actively involved in, um, for example, autonomous systems. I am likened to thinking that, wow, we are in the cutting edge of technology. You know, we already have self-driving cars. So, uh, you know, for most of us, we, we think that it's already happening. And I mean, also all these autonomous systems are not only in cars, like we said, they're in industries and already they are cutting jobs of people. So it's interesting that you being from the ground is saying, nah, actually, mm, it's not as great as you think it is because here as everyday normal, um, you know, your lay, your lay person is actually thinking like we are, of course, we're not where we thought would be like driving, you know, what, what do you call those things? Like those flying cars. But I think, you know, in terms of where we are, it's, it's, I, I thought we were very far into it, but then now um, I'm like, mm, okay, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of those tensions that's uh, coming into the light um, in recent years. I think if you ask a lot of AI researchers, we've done a lot of really incredible things. And I really don't want to downplay the great work that is being done within AI right now. But at the same time, yeah. um, some of the things that are being presented in the media are just divorced from reality. So if we even just look at the self-driving industry. Um, yeah. The self-driving industry said that we would have fully autonomous cars by 2020. But, and then Tesla and some other companies as well said that we would have self-driving cars. But if you now look at the statements that they're kind of, they're putting out now, is mm. we won't have those things, possibly not, not even in the next five years. Um, it's just wow. been a realization that to develop a fully self-driving car has is a lot more complicated uh, than they originally thought. So, so even the self-driving history, self-driving industry, it started with the DARPA grand challenges that happened in 2008 and even before that, where we showed that this technology was possible. But to actually make it safe and deploy mm. it in mass scale has actually been proved to be a very difficult problem. So, and that's one of the things, um, yes, AI is very good in structured contexts where things don't change so much. Um, but when things start to change, then it becomes a little fuzzier. And one of the biggest challenges for like just the self-driving uh, industry is humans. So the biggest challenge for self-driving cars from, in my perspective is humans. How do we predict what they're going to do? How how do we deal with them at crosswalks? I mean, even as a driver who just drives their own car, we struggle with this as well. So how do we yeah. prove that the car will perform uh, um, in a correct fashion at all times? So that's so we've developed, I guess, the groundwork up to 80% or maybe even 90%, but it's that last 10% that we have to get absolutely correct that'll be the most challenging stuff um, that mm. researchers have to figure out. So. Yeah, definitely, especially, in, like you said, in terms of the safety of it, which is mm -hmm. the most important part. There's no point in creating these cars and then a lot of injury um, tends up happening. Then it just, and then I think the whole public perception of these self-driving cars will then um, be shifted and people will not even want to. So all that work will just go to waste. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a problem that researchers are really considering very heavily now, um, especially even at these companies. You can see the work that companies like Waymo, uh, um, uh, Cruise, and other self-driving companies have been publishing in the last couple of years. So it's definitely something that is on the forefront of their minds. Mm, definitely. Wow, Patrick, you are into some very interesting research, and I love it. And we could go on for days talking about <laughs> this. But, um, you know, I just want you to just reflect for me, uh, given where you are right now, like in the field that you are in, what are some opportunities um, you being in the field of STEM, um, has being in the field of STEM allowed for you that possibly if you are not in where you are right now, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to do, you know, A, B, C, D? Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely STEM has been a blessing in many ways. Um, and it's allowed me to work on problems I didn't even think I could work on. Um, when I was in undergrad, I never thought I would work on autonomous vehicles or with drones at all. And even just to consider those problems is one of the things that I've really appreciated coming to grad school. Um, but beyond that, just working with such incredible people and listening to um, their perspectives on stuff and doing the work that they're doing that you wouldn't otherwise hear about in other contexts. Um, there is mm. the stereotype that the, that 
academia is like an ivory tower and there's a lot of sharing that happens within the tower but outside of that you don't, don't really see too much um and that's definitely something that's true and something that we need to change but just even just being within academia and seeing the kinds of problems that people are working on has been really inspiring and even just traveling and meeting new people um stem has allowed me to do that as well but it's also just allowed me to be creative and to reimagine things and to consider problems that i didn't think i had any business to, uh imagining in the first place so that's kind of been one of the blessings of stem so been for me Wow, that's fantastic. And, you know, like you said, um, being in STEM, I think sometimes people have this perception that, like you said, that it's like a big ivory tower and we need to 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 demystify that misconception. And one of these misconceptions is that um, for somebody who is in PhD and even this, the work that you're doing, you know, one would be like, oh, my word, he is incredibly smart. Not to take anything away from you, not saying mm-hmm. that you aren't. Um, and they might assume that, you know, the journey was easy, but I'm sure that wasn't the case. So how were you able to sometimes, because there are moments where you might feel doubt and you, you might feel like, oh my word, I can't do this anymore. So on a personal note, how were you able to overcome those moments um, and to just continue going forth in this pursuit of your dream um, without giving up? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't think I've ever overcome those things. And I think I carry those things with me every day. And it's kind of been a journey to try and figure out how to deal with those very valid feelings. And one thing, I think I'm very... I'm still very much on that journey. Um, The one thing I know is that I haven't done it by myself. And the people in my corner have been massive. My friends, my family, and my therapist who've been huge in getting me to where I am. So Mm. earlier this year, I read a book called A Liberated Liberated Mind by Dr. Stephen Hayes. And in it, he gave me a technique to kind of deal with these thoughts. And I highly recommend the book, by the way. It's absolutely Mm. fantastic. So the strategy he talks about is writing writing down the thoughts of self doubt out and whatever else on a piece of paper and then asking yourself if you'd be willing to carry those thoughts with you on your journey and if you are you put them in your pocket and you let them come along for the ride so whenever you feel those thoughts coming up again you pat your pocket as if to acknowledge that they are valid but they are part of your journey and they are welcome to come along for the ride and that's kind of helped me really deal with those things personally it helps me to know that i've dealt with the thoughts and they and while they're part of my journey they don't define my journey um, mm. And it just also helps me realize that they're just thoughts, um, which has been huge for me. So, wow, I love that, like that technique. And I'm sure, like you said, that I I need to look up that book because um, I think sometimes those thoughts can be so debilitating. Like it can consume you so much that you start, you know, self doubting, and you end up not actually being able to 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 work because we don't really get told to well most people don't really know how to acknowledge those feelings and i'm also talking on a on my own personal note Mm -hmm. that you know it's really hard to acknowledge okay you know what today i don't feel that good or you know i don't feel that smart today or you know this paper is really showing me (laughs) um, time (laughs) or whatever project (laughs) i'm working on but just like you said, just being very conscious that those thoughts are there because we always tend to push them away. Like, I don't have time to do that right now. You know, yeah. I need to do this thing. So I love that technique. That is absolutely brilliant. And I hope, um, so it, it, I hope others maybe will look into the book and just learn more. Yeah, definitely. The book has, has really changed my life. Um, uh, just even treating thoughts as thoughts and realizing that we're not our thoughts and kind yeah. of just that spirit, that spirit of mindfulness is, has been massive for me. So, Yeah. Please just repeat the, the title of the book. So the title of the book is called A Liberated Mind and it's by Dr. Stephen Hayes. Okay. So just in case somebody missed it in the first part. Yeah, just look definitely. Inside. Um, so, you know, just to wrap it up as we're getting to the end of this very awesome chat that we've been having and all the stuff that you've taught us. I just want you to just leave us with your final thoughts in terms of advice to somebody who's listening and just hearing about everything that you're doing. Um, an African and STEM particularly who, who is inspired by you. Um, what advice would you give to them about getting into STEM generally and also about your field? Yeah, definitely. 
So I'll give you some advice that's really stuck with me for a long time. And that piece of advice is called, is don't feel behind. Um, and mm. just compare yourself to who you were yesterday and no one else. Because everyone progresses at a yeah. different rate. So try not to let anyone make you feel behind. The other thing is you probably don't know where you're going and that's all right. A nice quote from Bill Watterson mm-hmm. that I found the other day is that the truth of us, the truth is most of us discover where we are headed only when we arrive. At that time, we turn around and say, yes, this is obviously where I was going all along. It's a good idea to try and enjoy the scenery on the detours because you'll probably take a few. And I think that's really stuck with me. So if you have any interest in STEM, join the team. There's plenty of room for you here. And even more importantly, we need you to join STEM as well. Oh, I love it. I love the message. That was fantastic. You were fantastic. Thank you so much for um, just chatting with us, teaching us and motivating us. It's been great having you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I love the podcast and what you're doing. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. Ah, It's been a pleasure. And to everybody else out there who's listening, first of all, look into those book recommendations. They sound really good. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to another episode of the Roots of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Until next time, bye.